What is up, everybody? I am Kevin Ioli. Thank you for joining me. And that is one of my favorite people to interview. I have talked to her so many times over the years. As a fighter, as an MMA fighter, as a boxer, as a world champion, uh, now I guess it's a, a new phase for us, right? Heather Hardy, we are now talking. She is a manager of fighters, no longer an active uh, fighter. We're going to get into all of that. Heather, welcome. I appreciate you joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Kevin. Thank you. Your uh, fighting career, I mean, uh, maybe not the most talented fighter that ever uh, stepped foot in the ring, but you delivered the entertainment. I mean, anytime uh, people saw you fight, uh, you gave them their money's worth, win, lose, or draw, 24-3 and three with four knockouts in boxing. Um, what, was your, what was your MMA record? You fought a few fights for Bellator. What were you in MMA? Two and two. Two and two in MMA, so... And, and I would say out of those 27 uh, boxing matches and those four MMA fights, like 25 were bangers. I mean, they were can't miss yeah. fights. <laughs> they sure had to be, right? <laughs> Why is it that you decided you've had enough? You know, you were successful. You won a world title. You fought a lot of people. What was it that led you to this decision? Uh, sure. So um, after my last fight with Amanda, last August I fought Amanda Serrano. And we had a 10 round banger. Obviously, I lost by decision. Um, but after the fight, uh, when I got home, I woke up the next day and I was seeing double. And hold on a second. Babe, can you put that light on? Sorry. Uh, I was seeing double. And um, I called Lou because by the end of the day, like it's super Lou DeBella, super, yeah, Lou DeBella, my promoter, it's super common, you know, to have. Um, I'm not smart. There was a light right there. Um, so I called Lou and I told him and, you know, he sent me to get an MRI right away. And um, they said that it was the after effects of a concussion. And they said the same thing when I went to for the CAT scans that the doctor said, like, don't get hit and it'll eventually get better. You'll be fine. And a um, couple months went by and um, it didn't really get better. It, it just got used to being bad. Right. It's like anything else in life. So what was it know. like? Let's get specific a quick second. When you say it didn't get better, what was happening to you? Sure. So my vision was double and split like this and um, blurry. And wow. um, it still is. I say it was, but that's how it went. I went and blurry. And I guess you just got uh, used to it for a while, after a while. And then, um, you know, the after effects of things like that is headaches because it's like super hard to see. And um, I was really nauseous. I went down to... Like 121 pounds, which I was a 125 pound fighter, but I was a fat girl always, right? So uh, that's very light for me. Um, I wasn't sleeping. A lot of minor inconveniences, right? Like after training, my eyes, it would be like I was looking through a paper towel holder. So I would leave the gym and I didn't tell anybody because wow. I had this bare knuckle fight coming up and you know, I had all these these big plans to do this world title at Mohegan Sun with Christine Freya. And um, I was like falling down the stairs of the train station because I couldn't see hitting people on my bicycle. And I'm just thinking, it's normal, it's normal. At least I'm on weight, you know. And um, I had a sparring session at Gleason's with one of the guys who was just like kind of going easy on me. And usually the, you know, the sight problems and stuff would focus back in and it would go from just looking through paper towel holder to just regular kind of, you know, I don't know where those hearts came from, but you love me. Come on. <laughs> My heart shaped glasses, maybe. I don't know. But um, exactly. Uh, but uh, that made me totally lose my my train of thought. No, but I had this last barn session um, where my vision was kind of like through that paper towel holder for two days and I couldn't see anything. And um, I was used to it going back gradually, but I had spent two days where I couldn't see and it was a Friday and I didn't sleep. And I didn't eat. And Monday morning, um, I called my mom. And I told her, she was the first one I told, because my mom, you know, my father is a preacher, and we're very uh, Irish Catholic. We had, you know, crosses on the walls and everything. And I told my mom, and I said, I can't see. You know, what am I going to do? And she said, well, it sounds like you're going to need a dog and a stick. <laughs> you know, God forbid. But... It was that day I went in and I told Bruce and I told Martine, my trainer, that um, I'm too weak to do this anymore. And they forced me to go to the doctor. And um, he said that, I, 
I had too many concussions over the years. And then every time you have a concussion, a piece of your brain dies. Yes. And you lose that piece of your brain. And it, you you don't really know what you lost. It just, you just live without it. So mm -hmm. memories, so much is just, it is gone. But what was happening whenever my heart rate goes up because I had kind of challenged what the doctors had said and took the fight with my vision bad. Now, every time my heart rate goes up, I have to kind of train to get it to go back down and such, you know? And um, so pulling out of the fight was, you know, they told me in the, the office it could have cost me my life. That's amazing. Well, Heather, <laughs> let's go back before we go forward, because um, this is like I boxing has changed my life. I've I've covered boxing since I was in college in the seventies, right? And I've lived a great life in large part because of covering this sport. Um, but I've seen the downside. You know, I have been at ringside for seven fighters who lost their lives in the ring. Just the worst thing that you can ever imagine. And uh, countless other fighters who ended up with with brain injuries and, and aren't aren't normal. And I'm sure you know some of them. I mean, I, I won't even say it, but like I I've had this picture here since, since Pat died. Patrick Day, yeah, he was. Um, and that, so I guess my question, first of all, would be, as your career was getting into the second half uh, and you're fighting a high contact style, did you notice anything in your personal life like that was changing in you? Things, did you feel bad? Did you feel funny? Were there any side effects during your career? Sure, you know, like, I mean, I was a girl from Brooklyn, you know, my mother's been telling me, asking me if I have brain damage for 40 years. Uh, aside from that, and, uh, you know, we always told jokes when my daughter was young, like, don't ask mommy, she gets hit in the head a lot. Mommy forgets everything. And it was always kind of just a joke that mommy was forgetful. But when you're thinking things, you know, in terms of over the years, the way that I do forget things, um, I can think back to sparring sessions at Gleason's gym when I was training for kickboxing. Wow. I can remember getting hit with a heel kick one day, Alicia Ashley, world champion. And um, I can remember after the sparring, I sat down on the side of the ring and I couldn't remember how I got to the gym. And I remember Alicia came and sat next to me and I said, I'm really scared because I can't remember anything from when I got up. And you know, we had the, conversation that it was a concussion and I would be okay just give it a few minutes and right. that was kind of what happened after the fight with Amanda right. you know, give it six to eight months you'll be fine and um like everything else in life you know what does the doctor tell you how many drinks a week do you have four yeah. how many drinks do you have 70 right that's an accurate number <laughs> sometimes I'll have 70 drinks that week you know if there's a party twice and couple you know i like to say i'm new york so by two a night you don't tell the doctor that no nobody could tell you're a new yorker right nah you don't think so i took my wu-tang shirt off i swear to god about 15 minutes ago <laughs> i told my my fiance i said i can't have the yankee hat on this fucking shirt on <laughs> <laughs> well so so as you're going through that you never mentioned to a trainer you never mentioned to the promoter and manager anybody that hey you know things are not right in, in my body. And you know, and, and you, you never said that to anybody other than fighters that you shared it with? No, no, because it's so common. It's so common. It's never like, mom, I forgot something. Fighters are not um, built to worry about the physical before they get in the ring. And if fighters do think of that, clearly you've seen every one of my fights. I don't. <laughs> I don't fight like I'm, you know, people always said to me, oh, you're so pretty, what do you fight? But it just proves it. People are thinking of my face, not, hey, you're getting brain damage. If you think of it in terms right. of, I've had clients, you know, who have said to me in the past, um, I have to be careful with hitting the bag because I, I just had a concussion from a car accident. And when I think of that, some of my sparring sessions have been, worse than my fights. I've probably yeah. had over 300, the equivalent of over 300 car accidents. My brain has taken that much damage. Like I've had 300 minor car accidents. And it kind of 
you know, drove me into wanting to be a manager, this motherly feeling of every time one of my kids gets hit, I'm putting them in a car crash. It's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, do you, talking about your health, um, do you have a clean bill of health? Like if you do not fight and you don't get hit, you don't spar, are you going to be okay? Or are there permanent changes in your life that you're going to have to deal with going forward? So um, they said that there's no way of knowing. They said that it won't get worse, um, but they don't know how much it will get better. And um, when I went the second time to the doctor, he was kind of like, well, can you fucking listen this time? Because last time I said, don't get hit, and you didn't listen. And this time I'm saying, don't get hit. So, you know, and I was like, no, I get it this time, right, you know. And um, so he said it could be like six months to a year. And um, some days I feel like it's going to be great. And other days it's not. And I, and, and, you know, I can only really go outside for like four or five hours. And it's gotta be when I'm at the gym because I have to earn money still. Like right. box, boxing, didn't, boxing left me to rent an apartment, you know? And um, so I'll go to the gym and it's minor things. You know, we talk about fighters who died in the ring. One day I was riding to work and I was riding past the piers and anyone who's a runner will tell you anyone who likes to jog outside when you have or bike riders when you have that change in t for to summer and you think like the coat comes off you know it's right. that you feel the sun and I, I rode past my favorite place and I thought I can never do that again because that type of stuff I can't I can't run I can't jog I can't hit the bag anymore I can't jump rope. So I was crying and feeling so sorry for myself. And I just thought, like, I'm not in a wheelchair. Right. How dare I? How dare I not be so grateful? I have my life. Can you, are you able, like, you said you can only be outside four to five hours a day. No, so I don't, the... like, disappear into thin air if I'm outside. Um, it's just, I kind of notice the formula, like when my heart rate goes up, like as if I'm exercising or walking around, um, it kind of throws off my vision, which leads into the other shit, right? Like I'm bumping into stuff. I fall down the stairs, I fall off the bike, shit like that. And then the blurriness will just make me so nauseous. And if I'm in places that's too busy, like I work the fight show, so it's like Times Square and my peripheral vision is really affected. So you get like super nauseous and I'm just winded. So I'll find myself having plans with my daughter or like important meetings with people for work and I'm canceling at three o'clock cause I'm sick and I'm nauseous and I can't mm. physically get off my couch. What about insurance? Like, do you have insurance? You know, because that, that's one of the things for fighters they don't have, right? So, so that like, if you could change anything about boxing, is insurance something that you would change? Oh my gosh! Over the years, I mean, one inside joke with fighters is like, you know, it's like, oh, you know, you walk around the gym with the knee brace on. You go to the doctor. No, nah, I'm fighting next month. I'll get in the thirty days, right? So, in other words, I'll tell them it happened in the fight, so I can get it in the right. thirty days, right? Like. You get everything in the 30 days and a lot of the medical doctors, part of the commissions and stuff, they get to know some of us fighters 10, 15 years and we'll be able to call and say like, I'm, I'm coughing and the snot is, is green. I think I need an antibiotic and they'll go, what are you allergic to? And then they'll send it for us. So a lot of us don't have insurance. What I have now is I don't need, you know, a Z pack. I need a fucking CAT scan. So Yeah, that's a little okay. So I guess we're gonna see, right? Yeah, that's that's the tough part of it. Do you regret anything? Like when you look back, you know, I, I remember talking to you when you beat Shelly Vincent to become the world champion. And I mean that was like you were euphoric, right? That was Pete Heather Hardy. Um when you look back, is it was it worth it or do you wish you had done something different with your life? I I I am so proud of my life. You know, like I fought so hard to have my life. So sorry. It's okay. Because you can't help but think it, right? Like, what if you did something different? Well, my mom always said, if my mother had balls, she'd be my father. So you don't ask yourself what if. The reason why you do something is because 
is who you are. Part this of is you. who I am. So thankfully, God gave me my life and to keep on this mission. And if my, you know, my, my reason wasn't to be a fighter. One of the first things you said in the interview was, well, she's not very good. <laughs> I didn't say that. Well, it sounded like that. I no, I, I said you weren't the best fighter in the See? world, but you were entertaining. No, no, we should do this as another lesson because I tell my fiance this shit all the time. It doesn't matter what you said. It's what I heard. <laughs> 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 well, we have it on tape, so we can we can go back. But I mean, Lou DiBella also, it is what he said, and it is what I heard, and he'll say it's what he said, that I'll never be a Hall of Famer. You said to me, the first day my pro debut after the girl knocked me on the ground and I beat the shit out of her, he said, you know, you'll never be a Hall of Famer, but I know you're going to be something. You know, I became... I became you got to the peak of your profession, so I mean, that's... that. I like, know. So here's a question that I think I... I I mentioned before I had the unfortunate duty of covering seven fights where a fighter has passed and countless other ones where I wasn't actually at the fight where then, then it happened. And I've never heard a fighter address this. And I wonder since you're in the situation you are, if you can, how do you guys deal with that? When, when a fighter, your friend Patrick Day passed, uh, you know, there were so, you know, uh, so many, I think Evander Johnson, I, I'll never forget, uh, seeing Jesus Chavez, who fought Levander Johnson in his last fight, and, and Bill Johnson, Levander's father, in the hospital embracing each other, right? I'm in the emergency room, and I saw that. When something happens to another fighter, how do you rationalize it as, as opposed to, like, if it was me, I'd say, I'm done with this shit, right? I can't do this anymore. You kept going on. What is the mind of a fighter like when you hear that kind of tragedy? That's a brilliant question. I mean, the first thing that I won't say what I felt or what the first thing that I noticed from the community was the amount of people who blamed other people, right? Mm -hmm. Like the amount of people who would say it's this person's fault because they didn't protect him or it's this person's fault because they were greedy or it's this person's fault. And at the end of the day, it just made me realize the nature of the sport. And I can say the same thing when Pat passed away as when my father, when Papa Roca passed away. The morning after he died, I stood in Gleason's and it was the first time I ever saw Bruce cry, right? Like Bruce, Bruce. So Bruce Silverglade, the owner of Gleason's for people who don't know. For people who don't know, Bruce Silverglade was like my father. Um, you know, Papa was my dad, Roca. And the morning that he died, um, the hospital called me to come, you know, identify that I was the next to kin on the paperwork. So right. I got the call at 3 a.m. And I had to find out all the shit that you have to do to your parents, you know? Right. And um, when I had walked back to the hospital to Bruce, I mean, his heart was broken. That was his, his best friend, but we both marveled just at how life goes on, how boxing goes on without you, and that you really have to take care and protect yourself. And it was almost like Roka's death, you know, had brought Bruce so close to me because in the end, the first person I told, right, that I have to pull out of this fight, I can't do it. Bruce said, I'll almost pay you not to do it. You can't. I've seen too many people forget their names, you know. Yeah. Mm, that's rough. So as a manager now, so how did you decide to become a manager? How many fighters do you have? And I guess this is how do you prevent what happened to Pat, what happened to you from the fighters that you managed? Sure. So, I mean, this this all kind of came together, like, strangely. Um, the, the, the way that the management company had initially started, obviously, it was a good friend of mine who reached out in regards to Kenny Enriquez, who is, I'm sure you're familiar with, she's an old school, an old head, 28 and 1. Um, but she's been waiting for the WBC world title shot as the interim world champion for a year. And um, that belt got kind of hung up in Golden Boy in a what's now, you know, forming to be a trilogy. And in the meantime, Kenya has been here in Miami with no representation, nobody helping her, nobody fighting her, just kind of waiting for the WBC to go, hey, when is it going to be my turn? And um, when my friend called me, I was like, yeah, whatever, because you know me, I'm nosy, motherly, I hate when shit ain't fair. And um it was in the process of me developing this management company. And um, at the same time, the same friend had another boxing related question, a trio of sisters from Hawaii. 
the Cottrell sisters, who have 20 something amateur national titles between them. They're knocking out girls left and right. And um, this 17 year old was asked to go be a sparring partner for a world champion and wasn't being offered any money. And um, I just thought, wow, that's not fair. So here comes mom, like, wait a minute. Why, you know, what's going on here? I, first of all, I don't need you going to no sparring partner camps because you don't need to give her any, right? Think about it. Every time you go for a sparring session, it's going to be a car accident. Right. And when you have a world champion with a 16 year old, and we're not going to get paid and we're going to get treated like we should, you know, we are lucky to be there. Well, I'm not putting my kid in a car accident. And I had to ask the father and mother, do you want to do that? Right. Like be very aware right. of every situation you're being put in. And, and I feel like what keeps me different from other boxing managers or other promoters or other people who are full of shit who've tried to do it. I have a 10 year proven career that I'm not full of shit. And I speak up when stuff isn't fair. And I don't I don't ask for anything that I don't think is deserved. And for 10 years, when I was asking for equal pay, look at me now, right? Look at me now. What is the I'm, most you ever made in a fight? What was the most you made in one fight? So my last fight was with Amanda, which was kind of done as a, I, I don't know if I can actually say it off the record. Okay. On okay. the record, so don't say let it, me don't not. Say yeah. We'll pass. But do you feel like do you feel when you look at your career, and I and I don't ask this question with malice towards Lou or anybody else. I know Lou loved you, right? Um, but do you feel like you were underpaid in your career? Well, here's what I will tell you about the ins and outs of boxing. The way that money changes hands is absolutely absurd, right? The way that money changes hands is absolutely absurd. So. When um, my promoter is offered a fight for Heather Hardy, part of his, you know, authority is to negotiate how much he wants for himself before the money even gets to me. And I realized so many times that if I had a manager, then the manager would then get to negotiate that money again before it gets to me. And then I realized that for all those fights, by the time it got to me, I had to pay my coach, right? So when I think in terms of how the money is made and the way that the hands are turned, like, you know, is turned over, like you can remove certain dishonest people from the equation. And I will very publicly tell everybody where the money's going. And you're going to see fighters making a lot more of the money than the middle people who are ruining boxing. You know, They're taking our money. How many? How many fucking managers shaved ten or fifteen thousand dollars off my purse and made it so that you know when I won my world title, Kevin, I rented a very expensive apartment close to Gleason's gym at the time because I could either stay in the shitty neighborhood I grew up and have to pay to put my daughter in private school because I didn't want her to go to public school there, or I could sleep on a couch for ten years and rent a 600 square foot apartment next to the gym where my daughter could get hand walked to school by me and I didn't have to pay for childcare. And for 10 years, all the people in my promoter's office and at Barclays and at PBC, all everyone said is she's always trying for money and she lives in Dumbo. HBO televised my world title fight. Right. Me and Shelly Vincent sold out the Hulu theater ourselves, like over 40,000, $45,000 in tickets together. And I swear to God, I came home with my world title and slept on a couch. Mm. Make that make sense. They said, HBO will put you on, but they won't give you money. All right. How many people got money and made me go home and sleep on the couch? That's who I want to be held accountable for. So as much as I might be out here fighting for my clients and fighting for what's not right, it's like, no, 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 no. You got over on me last time. Now I want to get paid. You know what I mean? So, how do you, so here's, here's the question, right? It Boxing has been this way for years, right? So, and then you didn't mention, you know, the state of New York wants their tax money. The commission wants its money for the fees. Yeah. The, obviously, Uncle Sam, the federal government wants its money for your thing. So you you don't bring home the same amount that people say, oh, Heather already made, you know, $50,000 in this fight. 
Right. What actually goes in the bank after everybody's paid. Oh, forget it? it. Let me get my charger. I just realized I'm on 2%. One second. Literally in the outlet. Right. All right. We are back. So, Heather. All right. These uh, cell phone batteries. I, I talk too long in these interviews, so these cell phone batteries cannot last my questions. So, uh, Heather is back. <laughs> We got the phone plugged in. She is good, uh, so we'll we'll wrap this up. Um, but how, so, how long are you going to do this? Is this going to be the rest of your life thing, or are you just going to do this for a while to try to until you transition into some other you know some other line of work? I'll be quite honest with you. The last few uh, days have really hit more home than the management company and the girls and them training. Um, Part of what I've been doing with the Give a Kid a Dream Foundation and um, the Porch Life Foundation is really where I want to spend probably the next chapter of my life, putting my heart and soul into that. Very good, very good. And what and what do they benefit? Oh, I God, I've been talking about this all day. So I thought we I literally hung up a call and was telling someone. So sorry, I forgot. Um, Clearly, I have brain damage too, right? So, like, you juggle. Is it the 42 or is it the brain damage? Um, when I started working at Gleason's, training at Gleason's, I've been very vocal about my uh, participation in the Give a Kid a Dream program. And about 14, 15 years ago, I joined with Bruce and we take inner city kids off the streets, recommended through parole offices and probation and stuff like that. And um, I'm just going to flip this. Does that work? Yes. You're good. You're good. Okay. So we take inner city kids and we bring them in. And the long and the short of it is for, you know, the first four or five years of my pro career, I would work at the front desk at Gleason's and have these little snot-nosed brats training with me and, you know, sharing lunch. And they'd come to Annie's communion and, you know, we've had them at family barbecues. They became family to me. And as they graduate, and we stopped funding them through the program. I kind of always told them, you know, mom leaves the porch light on. Anytime you want to come home, I got an office in my locker. And um, over the, forgive me, over the years, there've been a handful of kids that they get in trouble, but they try. And, um, you know, they'll come in in their Starbucks uniforms, like, oh, ready for boxing and they'll try and no matter what they always know that they can come back and um after my career ended i realized how many of them i had to let go sure and how many of them i had to say that <laughs> that you just gotta give me some time to figure it out you know and i'm irish and thick-headed and we don't ask for help and there was one kid that I was so worried about. So I asked one of the, maybe I put it up on an Instagram story and I said, you know, if anybody wants to help sponsor one of my fighters and the girl went to the gym and sorry, I'm crying. I just can't help it. The other, it's okay. You're fine. It's and, okay. um, the girl had, had went to the gym and said, you know, don't tell Heather. I know what she does with those kids. I watch her every day. Um, give me one of them. And um, I thought, huh, you know what? I don't maybe have to help everybody. I'm, I can't even pay my own rent, right? <laughs> right? I just lost my career, my job. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Maybe somebody else will help. And um, I had talked to somebody else at the gym that I thought maybe would help. And instead this person inspired me to start the Porch Light Foundation and to kind of talk to people about it that, we have a lot of kids that I don't want to give up on. I don't right. want anybody to give up on. So everything that you've been through in your life and you're still trying to give back to others, that says a lot about you, Heather Hardy. It's for me too. You entertain that you entertain thousands of people, millions of people over the years in your fights in the ring, and you're still trying to help. So I, I admire you for that. I know it's uh, it's a rough time in your life. I wish you the best in everything going forward. Uh, keep us abreast of everything that's going on in your life, and um, and God bless and and all the best to you. I certainly will. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks, Heather. All right.